Good evening, everyone. We begin by acknowledging that the Wiseman Art Museum is located on the traditional and contemporary land of the Dakota people. We aspire to honor and respect the indigenous peoples past, present, and future by incorporating indigenous knowledge in our work and by establishing meaningful reciprocal relationships with carriers of indigenous knowledge and with communities. I'm Katie Covey Spanier, Director of Public Programming and Student Engagement at the Wiseman Art Museum. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm glad to be here in conversation with you all. When Minneapolis became the epicenter of the nationwide protest movement against police brutality and racism in America following the death of George Floyd on May 25th, 2020, Textile Center and Women of Color Quilters Network joined forces to create We Are the Story, a multi-venue initiative in the Twin Cities that runs from September 10th, 2020 through June 12th, 2021. Under the curatorial direction of Dr. Carolyn Mizlumi, Women of Color Quilters Network founder and member of Textile Center's National Artist Advisory Council, We Are the Story explores themes of liberation, resistance, and empowerment, offering a visually compelling account of the breadth and experience and struggle that comprise Black history in an honest and critical way. The Wiseman currently has three works by artist Penny Mateer installed on site as a participant site in We're the Story. And tonight we'll hear from Carolyn Mizlumi about the history and work of the Women of Color Quilters Network and her curatorial vision for and process of developing We Are the Story. An artist and activist Penny Mateer will discuss her artistic practice and how that led her to, to develop the pieces that are featured in the show. Before we begin, I would like to thank the voters of Minnesota for supporting the operational budget of our museum through funds from the Minnesota State Arts Board. Thank you to Wells Fargo Foundation Minnesota and for supporting our operational budget. I'm grateful to my colleagues at the Wiseman Art Museum for helping to make this event happen this evening. As we begin our conversation, we invite you to submit your questions and thoughts to the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will respond to your questions in the Q&A period after the presentations. You may upvote the questions you're interested in by pressing the like button and questions with more votes will rise to the top of the queue. We will be recording tonight's event and it will be posted in the Wiseman's YouTube channel. We have live transcription for tonight's conversation available, but you need to turn it on to see it. Select show subtitles in the drop down menu under the live transcription tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. ASL services tonight are provided by ASL Interpreting Services Incorporated. And now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Carolyn Maslumi, historian, curator, author, lecturer, artist, mentor, founder, and facilitator, the remarkable and tireless Carolyn Mizlumi has left her mark on many lives. Trained as an aerospace engineer, she has turned her sights and tireless efforts in the 1980s to br bring the many unrecognized contributions of African Americans quilt artists to the attention of the American people, as well as the international art communities. From the founding of the African American Quilt Guild of Los Angeles in 1981 to the 1985 founding of the Women of Color Quilters Network. Carolyn has been at the forefront of educating the public about the diversity of interpretation, styles, and techniques among African American quilters, as well as educating a younger generation of African Americans about their own history through the quilts of the Women of Color Quilters Network that the members create. A major force as an artist in her own right, Carolyn's quilts can be found in private collections around the world, as well as in distinguished museum collections in the United States. An artist and activist, Penny Mateer. Penny Mateer works with textiles and recycled materials. Her art is rooted in quilting and embroidery, traditionally thought of as women's work drawing from this rich history of creating functional objects intended to provide warmth and comfort, she chooses fabric as her primary material to establish connection through shared experience 
and spark discussion around current events. Her social practice centers on a community made public art project to promote voting. Matir lives in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And now I'm so pleased to welcome Carolyn to the screen. Thank you, and I'm, I'm happy to be here this evening. Um, he pretty much gave a good description of the Women of Color Quilters Network. I uh, started it um, in 1985, and the purpose of it was to inform African American quilt makers not only about the cultural significance, but the monetary value of their work as well, because I noticed in my travels at the time, I would see quilts in galleries for sale and selling for enormous prices and wondered um, if the quilt makers were getting their fair share of the sales from their quilts. So we started out with nine members and just by word of mouth, um, the network has grown over the years to include almost 1,500 um, men and women. And we do have men, not many, only seven, uh, but they, they are a part of the network and very much active. Um, the purpose, again, is to document, present, preserve, and educate people about African-American quilt making. And the network has shown all around the world um, giving exhibitions. We've exhibited at the Smithsonian three times and we've exhibited in Japan, England, South Africa, Australia, Germany. And hopefully we'll be able to continue that um, for many years to come. Um, when George Floyd was murdered, I vividly recall seeing that video and my heart just broke. As a mother, it was terrible watching that. And when he called out for his mama, it was like a clarion call for every mother on the planet, okay? to You want to take care of your child nurture your child, protect your child. I thought, since I'm, I'm on the advisory board at the textile center, it would be a good idea to blanket the city of Minneapolis with quilts that dealt about racism in this country and brutality against African Americans. It's, I feel, an easy fix to address these issues in the form of quilts because everybody's familiar with quilts, pretty much. Everybody's familiar with fabric. We as human beings, we are swathed in fabric at birth. It's the last thing that touches our body upon our death. And when people think about quilts, they think about um, hearth and home and safety and security. So I feel it's a non-threatening way to talk about very tough subjects. And as an artist and as a curator, it's always my hope that people will look at these quilts and get a glimpse into how we feel as African Americans living in this climate uh, of brut uh, police brutality and racism and how it affects us. So to me, the quilts are like cultural documents. They're historic documents. Uh, they're no different. Um, it's like reading a book about history, only in this instance, you're, you're looking at it. As I said, uh, the network has been involved in showing quilts and most of our quilts are about social and political issues that affect our culture um, and sometimes issues that affect uh, minorities around the world. 
artists have always from day one um, involved themselves in the politics of wherever they live, uh, the social circumstance of wherever they're, they're living and whatever the political movement whatever the timber of the times is, there are always artists that are willing to create work about that situation. And I'm going to start my slide view here. Uh, one moment. As I said, you know, in the beginning, we um, in the Women of Color Quilters Network have been showing quilts about social issues for the past 35 years. And I'm going to start with some of these earlier quilts um, that, that we've shown in the past. This quilt was created uh, by Sylvia Hernandez, who also has a solo show up in Minneapolis at this time. And this quilt dealt with the September 15th, 1963 bombing at um, 16th Street Baptist Church in, in Birmingham, Alabama, which took the life of five, I'm sorry, four young girls. And this, this quilt commemorates that event. And I'm born and raised in the South. And I often think right now, it's like we're, I'm reliving the 40s and 50s all over again because of the times of this country right now. Um, this particular quilt is a special quilt uh, for me. Carolyn, I made it. Carolyn, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, you need to share your screen. I am. Sh I thought I was sharing. Oh. At the bottom of uh, the green button that says share screen on the Zoom screen. Wait a minute. Okay. One minute. Oh. Okay, did I, is it up? No. Uh, so, if you, and then if you click down on your PowerPoint, which it looks like is down on your bottom. Yeah, bar. you got it now? Yep. Is it up? And then, yep, and then if you press your slideshow button. Okay, sorry about that. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is the uh, photograph of the first quilt that I was talking about, about the church bombing in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And this is a second quilt that I made. And this is called, Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around. And as a young person growing up in Louisiana, I vividly remember watching the news report on television of 600 uh, peaceful, unarmed demonstrators in Selma uh, violently attacked while they were trying to um, cross the Pettus Bridge. They were driven back uh, and by state troopers and uh, beaten and attacked by dogs as they were trying to cross this bridge, trying to march to uh, Montgomery and I, I'll never forget that. And in particularly, I remember one man that was getting hit with the billy clubs and beaten by the dogs. And as a young person, I didn't know who that man was until I was an adult and found that it was John Lewis. And um, as a result of that day, which is known as Bloody Sunday, March 7th, 1965, and 50 march marchers were hospitalized. Um, that changed 
the civil rights movement, actually it became a marker because of television coverage of the violence and it was just so shocking for people around the nation to see all of this brutality. As a result of that, 800 people came from around the country from 22 states and they arrived in Selma and they made that march and it ended up to be almost uh, 25,000 people that uh, were in Montgomery. And that was a major catalyst for the civil rights movement. It was at a time too, after that, that President Johnson and uh, some key members of Congress passed the Voting Rights Act. And I have to say, I always said I would give this quilt to Congressman Lewis if I ever saw him. And it just so happened when I uh, won the National Heritage Award from the National Endowment for the Arts. He, um, I was able to meet him in his office and present him with this quilt. And it was the highlight of my life because I often think how many people are willing to put their lives on the line for freedom. And that kind of bravery is just, it's just awe-inspiring. This is another quilt made by a network member and it commemorates Katrina. Um, the, this hurricane did a lot of damage in New Orleans in uh, summer, August, August 29, 2005. And it disproportionately affected many African-American people living in, in the city. Um, people were not able to uh, leave the city and seek shelter. So there was a lot of not only physical destruction of life, uh, a lot of loss of life. So this particular quilt is a uh, quilt that tells that story about uh, the events of, of Hurricane Katrina. And when I talk about how the network has always done these quilts about social justice, issues that as adversely affect our community. This, this is one example. Two of the shows that are in Minneapolis are jury shows. And when I put out a call for the jury, I had people from around the world that responded, artists from around the world responded. And I was really surprised. Um, and the one commonality that we had was the fact that they said, my story was their story. The story of African-Americans and racism in America was their story too. It was their story in South Africa, in Paris, in London. Um, so the murder of George Floyd resonated around the world. Um, this quilt I commissioned is especially for the exhibits there in uh, Minneapolis, and it's made by Carolyn Crump. And um, you can look at it and see, it tells the story exactly of, of what was happening at, at the time during the demonstrations in Minneapolis. And this is a huge piece, it's about seven or seven feet square. This is one of the quilts that came from outside of the country and um, it deals with the taking down, the toppling of statues that are considered racist. This, this artist lives in London and here she, uh, on each side, you'll see monuments that are that have been toppled by people. Um, she has Frederick Douglass on one side and uh, President Obama on another side at the Lincoln Monument. And she's saying that these 
the toppling of these statues is not an attack on history. It is history in the making. This quilt by Mary Bernanke, White Silence is Violence, and it, the title says it all. When white people don't speak up, it's like you're condoning violence. You're not helping the, you're not helping the issue. Many of the quilts dealt with, you see the image of George Floyd uh, depicted in these quilts, many of them. And this particular quilt from Peggy Hartwell uh, from Somerville, South Carolina uh, was made in mind with him calling out for his mother. This quilt is also in the exhibition and um, this artist is asking the question, why are there different targets? You have different targets for African-Americans and you have different targets for white folks. Why is it that when the police shoot African-Americans, okay, they shoot to kill. Um, they don't necessarily shoot to cripple and stop them. They shoot to kill. One of the exhibitions in the, um, within the seven exhibitions in Minneapolis, is Gone But Not Forgotten, that's the title. And it memorializes people that have died um, through police brutality, <clears throat> people that have been killed by the police. And we want to remember them. We want to call their names, that's important. Call their names so that they're not forgotten. This quilt is by Sherry Carey Harlan. And also this quilt is a reference to uh, Bloody Sunday, the quilt that um, I made, I showed you earlier that I made. And okay. As I said earlier, quilts are like cultural documents. They're no different. Uh, people who, and historians will look at these quilts hundreds of years from now and get a glimpse as to what was going on here in the United States at the time we made the quilt. Um, all of these quilts, it's my hope that people see these quilts and think about what's going on in this country. Looking at these quilts with others offers an opportunity for some discussion, hopefully a broad discussion between African Americans and other people outside of the culture, white folks. So as I said, looking at these quilts and looking at the stories, it's a soft way again, to talk about very difficult subjects, police brutality and racism is not something that's easily talked about. So it's my hope that the quilts being there in Minneapolis will make a difference. And I hope many people get to see them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ms. Lumi. And um, I invite all of the folks that are out in the audience um, to continue submitting their questions in the Q&A uh, for Carolyn um, and for Penny now, as we transition over into Penny's presentation, while well, she will share with us a bit about her body of work, as well as the process that went into creating the works that are on view at the Wiseman Art Museum as part of this multi-site installation, We Are the Story. Now, Penny, uh, I welcome you to the screen. Hang on. 
one just a second. All right, here we go. Um, I want to begin by um, just saying how honored I am um, to be part of um, We Are the Story. Um, when Dr. Maslumi um, called um, and I uh, to invite me to be part of this exhibition, um, I was honored, but it's also, of course, very bittersweet. Um, because how angry and how sad we are about the events that took place in Minneapolis with the murder of George Floyd. Um, but I have um, been familiar with Dr. Mezzalumi and her work and the network for many years. I've had the um, uh, delight to be able to hear her speak in Pittsburgh many years ago. Um, and I've um, some dear friends of mine have been in some of her touring exhibitions and have their publications. So it's wonderful to be with her tonight. And I also want to thank the um, Weissman Art Museum for exhibiting the work that I'm going to talk about this evening. Um, so I thought that, uh, and I also just want to add to that I hope um, I'll be able to come to Minneapolis and see the work in person. Um, I'm hoping that uh, by May we'll be able to travel. It's a little far to drive here from Pittsburgh. Um, so I want to start um, talking just a little bit about my art practice and how I come to make the work that I do. And this slide, I think, kind of captures it really well. There are sort of three tracks to the type of work that I make. Um, sadly, this is a little bit of out of focus um, photo, but um, this is a show that's called Embedded Messages that was, I believe, uh, this particular iteration of it was in California. Um, but anyway, um, so what I do is I, um, uh, my work is rooted in quilts and textiles, which you can see on the right. I also do a lot of installation, sort of playing with patchwork and pattern, which you can see in the center. And then another track of my work is newspaper and newspaper collages. Um, and then the third track is social practice um, and art activism, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, but um, it all originates from the same place, and that's the news and pressing issues of the day. Um, so I'm an advocate um, for those who've been marginalized, and um, I attempt to raise awareness about specific issues in what's going on in our society and culture, and to educate. And um, I would say that it's um, an outgrowth of my work as a social worker. Um, for many years, I worked exclusively with people who were HIV infected or who had AIDS at the beginning of the epidemic. And so um, I think that the force and power of my work and my voice really comes from um, all of the men and women I worked on and walked beside um, during um, my time as a social worker. So um, really what I'm trying to do with the work that I make is uh, raise questions and try to make sense of it and try to engage the audience um, through my research and presentation to think about what's happening around us. Um, so the other piece of my um, work is um, activism. And um, so this is a project that I run that's called Pole to Poles. Um, uh, it's initiated from um, recycled material that we had from a public art project that we did here in Pittsburgh, uh, Knit the Bridge. And in 2014, we launched it. And what you see here, um, the vote signs around utility poles, which is why it's called Pole to Poles. And we did some yarn bombing. And the whole idea of the con, uh, the whole idea of it is that um, we're just trying to. Um, get people out there to vote and to think about it, to remind them. Um, and what we find is that people really respond, like the quilts, they really respond to something that's made. Um, we do it in um, community groups. We go into different areas of the city. It's all free. It's all volunteer. Um, we sort of work as in a construction line process, um, and everybody does a different piece of the sign. Um, some people cut out letters. Anybody can do it. Um, and this year, so we run it every other year. This year, um, we were able to uh, collaborate with an activist here in Pittsburgh 
Elaine Harris Fulton and her Wake Up the Vote Wilkinsburg. And through them, we were able to disseminate some 1,000 signs, um, which is more than we've ever made before and we're really proud of, which is why I'm sort of talking about it right now, um, because uh, it was the pandemic and we usually meet as a group. And the power of the project is because we all meet together, it's nonpartisan. Um, and everybody really just enjoys each other's company. And it's sort of the, the love and the growth of the community and the stitches that we put together that we put out there is kind of the power of the message. So it, this was uh, this is a, a very important part of the work that I do. But moving ahead now to what um, is actually on exhibition at uh, the Weissman Museum, the first two pieces that I'm going to talk about, um, the, the quilts, um, are from what I call the protest series. And here's the entirety of the protest series, um, which began in 2005. And so I think it's helpful to understand just a little bit about what this series is. So the first quilt that um, in the series is called All We Were Saying. Um, it was, I created it in 2005. Um, and that was the time that uh, George W. Bush was um, in office. And we had just um, gone to war in Iraq. And um, I couldn't help but think about um, what, uh, what had we learned when we were, uh, went to war in Vietnam? What did we learn from that? And how are we in Iraq now? And asking these kinds of questions. And I'm a product of the 60s and the 70s. Um, music is a very important part of everything that I do, of the work that I make. When I'm in the studio, there's always music playing. And the song that came to mind was, of course, John Lennon and Yoko Ono's um, Give Peace a Chance. And so I started thinking about like all we were, you know, all we are saying, of course, is one of the major lyrics. And I'm like, well, what were we saying? And all were we saying? And so this quote was born. And then right on its heels, I started thinking about Peter, Paul, and Mary. And then I started thinking about where have all the flowers gone? And to that, it became why have all the flowers gone? So that was sort of the birth of the protest series. Um, and I'm just going to back up for a second here. So um, I came to realize that it would be really interesting to sort of look at what was going on in contemporary times um, through the lens of 60s and 60s activism and in particularly through music. So each one of the series, the um, title of the work is a song that's from the 60s or the 70s, um, a protest tune. And as you can see, um, a lot of my work is influenced by pop art, um, by Andy Warhol, Peter Max, um, op art. But I've also been very influenced by some of the quilters here in Pittsburgh, who we have some an amazing uh, group of artists in Pittsburgh through um, many channels. And um, uh, in particular, I want to mention um, Tina Williams Brewer, who is um, one of my mentors and um, who tells and has uh, shares, um, uh, creates story quilts shares the stories of African-American history here in this area. And also Sean Quinlan, who does these incredible social commentary and political commentary quilts. That when I was just beginning to sort of explore this as a form of expression, they really showed me sort of a way and a path of how you can really introduce, as Dr. Maslumi talked about earlier, difficult topics for people to explore. And somehow it's safer because we can all, you know, we can all relate to what a quilt is and what it looks like. And, you know, maybe I had one on my bed or my grandmother made one or et cetera, et cetera. So moving ahead to um, what's here and um, part of We Are the Story, um, this quilt is the number 13 in the protest series. And it's entitled, This Revolution Will Not Be Televised. And um, it originated with uh, a, um, an article that I saw on gawker.com. I was, I don't know, scrolling uh, and, and, and stumbled upon it. 
And what, um, what the article was uh, written by Rich um, Joswiak and Alexander Chan, and what it was is a, a, they compiled a series of tweets and photos and details of um, a list of tweets of, from the NAACP that had uh, posted a series naming 76 individuals who were killed in police custody since 1999, following the announcement that the um, NYPD officer Daniel Pantaleo would not be in uh, would not be indicted for killing Eric Garner. And the way it was presented on the header of Gawker was sort of very Warholian, where you saw um, photos, you know, just sort of next to each other. And I looked at it and I said, oh my, my God, I was drawn to it, read the article, and it just, it screamed as a quilt. And I realized as I was reading the article, and on this, this quilt was created in 2015, um, that I didn't understand or really was very ill-informed and unaware about what was going on in our, um, um, in the African American community, and the police brutality, and um, and I needed to understand about that. I needed to talk about it. So I started to do um, research, and uh, the, of course, the book that I read, and I encourage everybody to read if you um, haven't um, yet, and that is *The New Jim Crow* by Michelle Alexander. And um, when I started thinking about what this quote would be or how to put together the uh, the question that came to mind was in and remember the protest series is rooted in 60s and 70s protest songs um and i was thinking about how did we get from black is beautiful to black lives matter and i thought it was really important to memorialize um the individuals who were referenced in his tweets. So this quilt is made in collaboration with my dear friend, um, Martha Wasik, who is a graphic designer. And um, Martha designed the border that you see. And um, as um, Dr. Maslumi um, mentioned earlier, it's extremely important that faces are named and are people and are humanized and understood as the beautiful individuals that they are or who they are. And so what you'll see here is when you see the quilt and it's it's a very large quilt, um, is that uh, for example, in the bottom right corner, number 58, the gentleman is Ronald Beasley, who was 36 years old, was in Delwood, Missouri, and he died on June 12, 2000. You'll also see that, um, so each block, this is a traditional, quilt block, it's called steampunk, um, that um, the center is, um, of course, a beautiful face. Um, but I'm very deliberate in all of the fabrics that I choose. Um, I collect commercial fabrics. I have all these crazy novelty fabrics. And sort of part of the challenge for me is each fabric is kind of a key to what I'm talking about or thinking about, or I want the viewer to stop and think about. So that when you look at this piece, um, the, of course, the dominating um, fabric is is handcuffs, and you know, and that's clearly a um, a reference to police. But the other piece of that also is that for me, it's also thinking about how structural and systemic racism really handcuffs our black and brown brothers and sisters in this country. And so that all of the fabrics that you see, like, you know, so there's money fabric and the, so thinking about the inequities in the system or, you know, there's dice, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a roll of the dice. It's supposed to be meritocracy. Is it really? Um, all of those, those ideas come into play. Um, and in the corners of the quilt, so you see in this particular corner, it's Black Lives Matter, but the opposite corners say Black is beautiful. So again, that question and that tension about how did we get there to here and what did I miss and what do I need to learn um, as we move forward. Um, and so also, this is the back of the quilt and all of the quilts that I make, the back of the quilt references the front. So in this particular case, we have the um, 
the uh, lyrics of um, the revolution will not be televised because that's the name of it. Um, again, when I do the titles, sometimes I'll use the actual title of the song, sometimes I'll use a lyric, and then sometimes I'll do just a little twist. Um, and in this case, um, it was a twist. And they're just sort of giving you the history of that particular quilt. The second quilt that's in um, We Are the Story at the museum is um, number 15. And this quilt is entitled Fight the Power from the Isley Brothers. And this is the first time, and as you recall, I talked sort of about how there's kind of different tracks of my work, um, where I decided to use one of the collages as a focal point and then create a quilt border around it. Um, and I'll get to the newspaper collages in a, in a little bit here. Um, and uh, this uh, particular collage, of course, um, references um, Colin Kaepernick and um, the gesture of kneeling in a sign of police brutality in the end, um, during the uh, national anthem of an NFL game. And so the question here I had to ask um, was immediately I thought of the 1968 Summer Olympics where we had Tommy Smith and John Carlos raise their fists in solidarity at the podium at the time that they were um, awarded a, an Olympic medal. And thinking about that time and the national who and cry at during that event, and now here we are again, and it's the same thing, and it's the NFL. And once again, Colin Kaepernick is misunderstood for how he is trying to call attention to a very dire situation in this country, and that it, um, in his gesture. So once again, um, I teamed up with my dear friend, Martha, and um, she designed the border blocks Again, we're referencing and naming the names and the places and the days of individuals who have died at the hands of the police. Um, but this is a variation of courthouse steps. And, um, and then in that, um, chose to sort of mimic the gesture. Um, and I also want to be sure that, um, and this is Martha, um, that uh, we also, it's the first time I've ever done any hand embroidery on one of these um, particular quilts. And we thought it was just really important to show the why of it and not just um, to, to really accent it with hand embroidery. And also this was the second quilt that Martha and I um, did together to have her hand in the work as well. Um, so now I'm gonna jump to, let's see here, uh, the newspaper collages that you saw centered in the, and talk a little bit about that. Um, so in 2006, um, my father died um, and I had been um, helping him uh, through that process. And after he died, I had a really hard time um, being able to concentrate or, or make a quilt or do any kind of artwork. And I really felt compelled to do something. And what could I do that was kind of easy? And I don't know. So I read the newspaper every day. Um, and um, I, I, I started thinking a lot about, um, again, this, this was in 2006. So this was a little while ago. Um, and we still got newspapers then, right? <laughs> um, what the transition is from um, print media to digital media and what an impact that has, and in particular on photographs and photojournalism. So that when, you, when, you, when you're holding a newspaper in your hand and you turn the page and your, your eye is caught by, by something, you can't help but look at it. Or, I mean, I think it, it often promotes empathy uh, given what many of the photos are that jo photojournalists um, uh, show but, um, or publish. Um, but when you're looking at a computer screen, you can just click away from it. And, and what does that mean? So I started um, making collages um, and they're just these little, you know, they're, they're in books. They're in, I'm not sure how well I'll be able to show this, but they're little 
five by seven, lots of notebooks. Um, um, and I just make them and I have made them on and off through the years. Um, so now um, in 2016, of course, Donald Trump was elected and um, my uh, sister lives in Manhattan and I was very familiar with Donald Trump and, and who he was. And no matter how you feel about Donald Trump, um, I got the sense that um, this particular presidency would be different than any in any history. Um, and I wanted to, uh, I decided to start chronicling that. So I began a series that initially um, was, and, and what it is, is uh, Monday through Saturday, I make a collage from the New York Times. Um, and it's only from that edition that day and each collage, the title of the piece is either a headline. So in this case, what you see here is a Louisiana congregations resolute after fires destroy three black churches. Um, and, um, or, it's head, it, or it's highlighted text. I keep um, a, a list on the back of the collage of every photo journalist work that is in that particular collage. Um, and I have these rules, everything is done hand cut, nothing's digital, what well, you saw the book, but um, I have these rules, like I, I'm not allowed to use illustration, I don't use text, and, and you know, every now and then I break them. But So I started it as the Resist series, and then I realized that if I call it the Resist series, then that's, you know, like half the country won't ever look at it, right? So, um, and I, I want people to think about what I'm saying or, or whatever. So I realized that the better way to call it would be in today's news. And I post each on Instagram, which is, um, uh, which has been quite an adventure. And um, so here, um, just to give you a sense, um, this is piece is called uh, hashtag in today's news hashtag social justice. Um, and it's an installation of cloth decals and what it is, is um, from the beginning of Donald, uh, President Trump's, uh, former President Trump's um, presidency uh, to, um, uh, I believe it's July 10th, 2018, and I'll show a detail here in a second. Um, these are the collages that I made that referenced some question about race issues of social justice. Um, and that were posted on Instagram. So you get this sense of a physical sense of a running story of what has been going on in this country. Um, and this is a um, close up of uh, what they look like um, to give you sort of an idea of some of them. Um, all right, so with these uh, collages, because you know they are small, um, in order to have a better impact or, you know, I think like the bigger, the better, right? <laughs> um, and to really get people to stop and think, I read an article in, um, uh, I think it was Surface Design, it was a Surface Design blog. And sadly, I cannot remember the name of the artist who, who posted or wrote about the cheapest way to um, print large format was Walmart. And you could send your work out and um, create and have it come back as a fleece blanket. So I started playing around with that. And in, I did, in fact, um, do that. And here is an example of one of the blankets um, that I made uh, or had had made. And the, um, the size is, you know, there's 79, it's a blanket, right? So there's 79 inches vertically and, you know, uh, 60 inches wide. And the idea is you, you just kind of can't, you can't turn away from it because they're so large. Um, this one is called the first consent decree was in Pittsburgh in 1997. Its impact did not stick. And this is from um, April 10th, 2017. So, um, so sadly in uh, uh, Pittsburgh and Minneapolis have something in common. In 1995, um, Johnny Gamage 
uh, died of uh, asphyxiation at the um, hands of actually the suburban police force in Pittsburgh. Um, there were no eyewitnesses to his murder. However, um, the uh, uh, Dr. Cyril Wecht, who was the um, uh, coroner at the time, ruled his um, death, death by asphyxiation. And what this references is, is the city of Pittsburgh um, did sort of attempt to create a decree to start to address the issues of police brutality, but it never did stick. Um, and so it, uh, to give you an idea of, of what goes on in Pittsburgh. Um, so he, here in um, Minneapolis, uh, this is the collage that I made um, after George Floyd was murdered. And um, it's a memorial collage. Um, the date was uh, that I, uh, from the New York Times, because it's always a day later, it's uh, May 27th, 2020. And it is also on exhibition here at the, um, at the museum and really sort of brings to the present. So, right, when you look at the work that's on exhibition here, the first work is 2015, the next work is, you know, 2018, and now we're here at 2020. And of course, the, the, the blanket that I just referenced, that's 1997, you go back to Rodney King, you can go further. I mean, you, I'm trying to help put together um, uh, a sense of the time that has passed and the need, the desperate, desperate need for change. Um, so the last uh, photo I have here in collage I wanna show you is um, actions speak louder than words. And this is um, also from Minneapolis, um, but also but inter interjected into, um, you may recall the uh, situation in Central Park where a gentleman was out bird watching um, and a young white woman um, felt she was being harassed and called the police, or I, I don't recall exactly what her rationale was for calling the police on him. Um, and it was, it was at the same time of what, would, what, was, what was going on in Minneapolis. Um, and it just spoke to me. And this particular, um, this is not a blanket, although I have it made as a blanket, Really, when you look at it, you sort of get the sense of, I mean, how difficult it would be and how much strength this young woman has when you see it that size and that scale to face against an armed policeman and a, you know, you know, a, a mask and, and all the rest of it. Um, and finally, I wanna say um, in closing um, that about, about the images that I choose, because I am a white woman and um, I've done a lot of work and research and lectured and discussions about cultural appropriation, um, trying to understand the best ways. Um, I, I think the best way for me to address it is, is this. Um, I think it's really important for my role to address structural and systemic racism. I think there are ways to do that, that show strength and humanity. Um, and, and you can do that in ways that I think most importantly, especially around issues of um, police brutality that do no further harm visually um, and are not re-traumatizing, but again, um, working to, to, to show the humanity and to help um, white folk understand how we need to listen, how we need to learn, and how we need to pay attention and do the work. And um, with that, um, thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Penny. Um, and now I'm going to invite Carolyn to also um, please join us as we jump into conversation with each other and um, with the audience. So um, I think I want to start it off with a question. Uh, Dr. Mazlomi, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about 
how you selected the works that are on view at the Wiseman and you know what that means to exhibit at a university campus um, the, as a seven site installation. I know there's different social relations. So if you could speak to that a bit. Oh, well, to exhibit at a, at a university, hopefully you kept, you have more uh, young people see the work. And I think it's important for young folks to see the work because they're the people that can help implement change that's necessary to eliminate uh, racism and discrimination. When I chose the quilts, I thought about the themes and my curatorial work is very intuitive. I look at the work and if it strikes me and it hits my spirit and I feel that it will make an impact with the viewer, I'm that's a quilt that I would want. I'm curating for storyline. Unlike a lot of exhibitions, especially quilt exhibitions, um, there's a set criteria um, dealing with the workmanship and how the quilt is structured and the colors and whatnot. I am looking for a strong story. I don't care about the structure of the quilt. I'm concerned that the quilt doesn't fall apart during the tour and it, it, it holds together during the tour. That's, that's all I'm concerned with. The strong point is the visual impact that that quilt makes on the audience. That's mm -hmm. my primary consideration. And I think if anybody has gone to those shows in um, any venue in Minneapolis, my point is well taken because I'm sure they get what we're trying to say. Certainly so. Um, you uh, talk a lot about being a curator, but you also are an artist um, and have a long history of creating a body of work. And when I did some, um, dug in a little bit, when you talked about some of your inspirations, you've spoken about how the civil rights movement and music from that era um, is a source of inspiration for you. And then Penny, likewise, tonight you discussed a bit about how songs of protest for the 70s and 80s um, have been a well of inspiration for you as you create in your studio. So um, this question is for both of you. Is there a song or an album that you continue to turn to? And if so, if you've felt that it has changed when you're listening to it, given kind of what has been going on in the past four years and really specifically in the last year. Ooh. I'll let Penny answer that. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Well, a couple of jump out right away. Sly and the Family Stone is one of them. And I can't tell you the name of the album. I'm really embarrassed to say, but um, the song Stand, has given great new meaning to me in this in this era, um, and that's actually what the uh, the name of the the piece of the the heads on the poles. Um, but I would also definitely say Marvin Gaye, who uh, and I and I listen to it, and uh, it I don't know it just. Um, but I guess in terms of difference, I would say Sly and the Family Stone, maybe. I have no particular favorite, but I love music. I can't, I can't function without music. I'm always playing music when I'm working and even when I'm not. That music is fuel for the spirit. It is fuel for the soul. It's, especially during the civil rights movement, it, it rejuvenated us spiritually and lifted us up so people could march. 
And I, I just, few, a few years ago, I wrote a book uh, called Textual Rhythms, Quilting the Jazz Tradition. And this is the book. And there's a quote in here that I, I want to read. And it's from Dr. Martin Luther King. And he talks about uh, the effect of music, especially jazz. And I love jazz and I love blues. And I just want to read this. Uh, it's a brief paragraph here. Um, God has brought many things out of, the, out of oppression. He has endowed his creatures with the capacity to create. And from this capacity has flowed the sweet songs of sorrow and joy that have allowed man to cope with his environment and different life situations. Jazz speaks for life. The blues tell the story of life's difficulties. And if you think for a moment, you will realize that they take the hardest realities of life and put them into music only to come out with some new hope or sense of triumph. This triumphant, this is triumphant music. Modern jazz has continued in this tradition, singing the songs of a more complicated urban existence. When life itself offers no order, and meaning. The musician creates an order and meaning from the sounds of the earth, which feel through, which flow through his instruments. It's no wonder that such, it's no wonder that so much of the search for identity among African Americans was championed by jazz music. Long before the modern essayists and scholars wrote, of racial identity as a problem for a multiracial world, musicians were returning to their roots to affirm that which was stirring within their souls. Much of the power of our freedom movement in the United States has come of age and begins um, from this music. It strengthened us with its sweet melodies that courage began and fail, it has calmed us with its rich melodies when spirits are low. Anyway, he said he spoke this at the uh, in 1964 at the Berlin Jazz Festival, and that pretty much says it all. You know, I for me, I can't function without music. It's fuel for the soul. Mm -hmm. Totally. Well, that's the the perfect transition to a question from an audience member. Um, so this is to both of you. Um, what do you see the difference are the differences are between the 1960s civil rights movement and today? Um, they say I was born in 1980, and I'm so sad history has repeated itself. I the difference to me is that right now I consider it this is this is worst. To me, it's worse. And the setbacks have been tremendous, tremendous. Um, as an elder African-American, I, I thought we were making progress. But this past administration has opened Pandora's box. <clears throat> and racism is on full frontal view for everybody. And I feel like it's like killing season for Black folks, uh, open season, open season on Black people. Uh, so I think we've regressed a lot. The Sometimes I feel like not much has changed. But hopefully I see that young people young people of both races are out there demonstrating and trying to make a difference. And our hope is in the youth, uh, that they can appreciate the diversity that is this country. But I feel we have a long, long 
long way to go. Yeah, I don't have much add to add to that for sure. Um, it is, um, it is the youth that we have where we have the hope and, uh, and yeah, it's uh, been a long, terrifying four years. Well, uh, speaking of the youth, part of the mission of the Women of Color Quilters Network is to create an intergenerational exchange and to engage folks from all different age groups. And so uh, Dr. Mizlumi, from your position as the, the founder and kind of seeing this organization grow, I wonder if you can speak a little bit about how you might see different approaches to quilt making and if you see a difference from younger, the way younger folks are approaching their narratives um, with some of the elders. Well, <laughs> I think that's pretty obvious when you think just even in terms of technique um, and how, how um, young people create their work. I'm 75 and I can remember uh, relatives and family friends that quilted and all they had was thread, needle, and the homemade um, quilt loom. So that was it. But things have changed now because of technology and materials and their soul so much that uh, is available now insofar as tools for the um, quilt maker to, to make their work. So that's different. And then the approaches and techniques are different. Um, I'm just surprised by the materials used and lots of I see lots of three-dimensional work being done now, and the work is quite different from the traditional work, say, uh, 50 years ago or before. So, and this is because of younger people. They're bringing a new energy, not only with the new techniques and materials, but a new energy to the art form. And that that's needed if we're to progress and pass this art form on to the next generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, someone from the audience has commented that the quilts are extremely powerful. Um, is there any plan to travel them to the Washington DC area in the future? We wish. <laughs> All I can say is Washington, if you're listening, <laughs> uh, <laughs> It, the show will travel, um, well, a pared down version of all the, a culmination of, combination of all the, the uh, seven shows will travel. So the next destination is uh, the Freedom Center in Cincinnati. And then I believe it's going to Houston and uh, we will keep the textile center in the loop in so far as the travel of this exhibition, but it's indeed traveling. We've gotten a lot of interest from museums around the country, even outside of the country. So it's traveling. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> someone's asked, um, they've said, thank you, Dr. Mislumi, for an informative and powerful presentation. You know, what, what's next for the Women of Colors Quilter Network? Well, <laughs> As I said, this show is traveling. And then we have two new shows. One's coming up at the end of the year. It deals with how COVID-19 has affected the African-American community. Because this pandemic has um, affected African-Americans disproportionately than most, we, I felt there, there was a need to address that issue. And the only way that I know how to address issues are make quilts and then, you know, write a catalog about that. So we 
we've lost 18 members of the network because of uh, COVID-19. So we will mo memorialize not only those members, but uh, just to tell the story of how this pandemic has affected this, our national uh, community because we've lost so much. Mm -hmm. And so that's one exhibition. And then we have another coming up at the end, well, at next year, early next year, and it's on the history of African Americans in the Western frontier. Mm -hmm. So there's always something. Mm -hmm. We'll stay tuned on that. So speaking of feeling hopeful for the future and planning ahead. There's a question to both of you of how you're feeling about the new administration and um, potentially how that may or may not affect your work. Well, I'm hopeful. <laughs> After the last four years, almost anything would <laughs> give me hope because it's been so bad. Um, it's strange. After the election, I heard from so many network members who said they were ready to get back to work and they were energized because I felt uh, that, like many of them, we were depressed. This, this overall political climate has been depressing along with the pandemic. It did not psychologically and spiritually um, make for um, a good atmosphere to work in. So there's, there's a lot of uh, hope that uh, people are feeling within the network, a lot of hope that things will get better and this is, um, I can see this in the way that people say they want to get back to work right away. So there's enthusiasm there and hope for the future, a better future. I have to say that um, I share the same hope um, uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, certainly, first of all, uh, the historic moment of um, Kamala Harris as a vice president, which is uh, such a, you know, wow. <laughs> um, and also the diversity of the cabinet members Definitely. is really, really hopeful. And um, so uh, uh, for that I am. Um, but at the same time, I, I also uh, want to hold the previous administration to account. So as, as hopeful as I am, um, the greatest hope in this in many ways was Georgia and um, how we were able to um, take the Senate, uh, thanks to um, all the amazing efforts of African-American women in Georgia, led um, particularly by, uh, of course, Stacey Abrams. So um, I'm really hopeful that that sends a message to all of us how important voting is and that uh, we can maybe make some change um, uh, given I think that there is uh, a little bit of uh, motivation and understanding, particularly around issues of police brutalities, sadly because of the murder of uh, George Floyd, that we might be in a position to really, hopefully, I don't know, <laughs> um, kind of take on some of these systemic and structural uh, racism in this country, so. Mm -hmm. So multiple reasons to feel hopeful, yes. Um, Cheryl Sims asks, uh, Penny, I like the subtle use of color change in your George Floyd quilt. I saw a faint diamond shape in the center background behind George Floyd's image. Did you use that technique to draw the viewer's eye in? Yeah, um, so that's, okay, that's actually a collage um, from a newspaper. Um, and yeah, definitely, that was, uh, I it was, uh, I should remember, um, it's uh, 
from an obituary, an artist died. It's actually a, another artist's work, that particular grid that draws your eye in. Mm -hmm. um, and I usually don't use other artists' work in these collages, but in this case, um, I thought it was the best way to represent and memorialize George Floyd. And I was hoping that would be forgiven in heaven for the artists but yeah so it was definitely deliberate because it was important to draw right to him material choices um are a big part of your body of work and thinking about um material choices dr Mislumi, your background is a as an aerospace engineer i have to imagine that you've spent a lot of time thinking about how everything in the universe got to be the way that it is. Um, and I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about the intersections of quilting and engineering. <laughs> well, first of all, engineers are designers and that's not unlike quilting, where the, you utilize those design methods to create uh, quilts in my case, in the case of an engineer, maybe that's an aircraft or an engine or a hydraulic system. It's all, it, it's design, it's design. Um, we use technology in making quilts. We use math in making quilts. I'm asked this question all the time. <laughs> how does this, how does engineering and, and, and art intersect? And I have to tell this story. Um, because I'm an, I'm an engineer, patterns and lines have to be very exact. When I first started out quilting, I, I love traditional quilts. They're my favorite quilts, but I can't make them. I had to stop making them because the lines and angles never met, okay? Um, then I started making the narrative quilts, and I'll never forget my first major show in Atlanta, and there was a review um, in the art section about the show, and it was a horrible review. <sighs> And one of the things that the, the reviewer said was how tight the work was. And um, it, it was just a horrible review. And that was, that was me, okay? The work had to be tight and it was, there was not very much imagination to it uh, because I, tended to overthink everything. And after I got that review, I came back home and I threw all my quilt books in the fireplace and burned them. <laughs> and and I, I started doing my own thing. And really it was very freeing, but I'll never forget that review. It was horrible. It was a horrible review. And I attribute that review to my background. Uh, mm. There was no, everything the reviewer said was true. <laughs> so uh, that I don't forget. So that's kind of adversely how my profession affected um, my artwork. But mm -hmm. we utilize pretty much the same tools. There are many uh, mathematicians that have written uh, books utilizing quilting to teach math to children. So I don't think there's, there's not that much difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your a rejection of the rules actually really freed your creative ability. It did. It made all the difference. And uh, <laughs> it's been smooth sailing ever since <laughs> because I don't think about the rules anymore. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, a kind of a connection connected question for Penny, stemming from your background um, in, as a social worker, um, then developed, you said, your practice of activism. And there's a question from the audience saying, so um, what inspires you to engage in art activism and what has been its impact? Um, wow, so, well, what inspires me? Um, I, I can't kind of sit back while things are happening. I think that is my, my social work advocacy um, piece. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I, I was a social worker with people with AIDS in the early years of the epidemic, um, which a lot of this history is now coming to the front because of the pandemic. A lot of the lessons we learned and Dr. Fauci in particular um, from AIDS and uh, ACT UP and activism. And, um, and when I started making quilts, I mean, I just love quilts and I just love putting them together and really hadn't thought about putting those two things together um, until uh, there was a, an initiative made by, uh, by a graphic designer here in Pittsburgh um, called the Partisan Project. And, and what it was was different graphic artists um, uh, got together and made uh, different posters that you could download from um, and print out on newsprint. Um, and, and you could put them in your windows. And the, the big thing was no W because it was when he was up for reelection. And I thought, oh, I'll make a quilt from that. And it was the first time I ever really thought about putting the two together. As I mentioned, you know, we have this history in Pittsburgh with Sean and Tina. Um, and uh, and yeah, it just like opened this world. It's like, as, as, as Carolyn was talking about um, how it gives people an entrance into talking about different issues. And so the issues are always there and always come up in, in every administration. And so looking ahead when, when, you know, even though I have hope, I will also be, I'm sure, you know, there'll, there'll be things I'll be talking about in quilts during Biden's administration, as that was true during Obama's administration. Um, maybe someday I do a celebration series, I hope. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Um, but anyway, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, it did. And so to this question of impact, uh, Dr. Mizlumi, um, now that these this the exhibitions have been up for a, a while despite COVID and many of them have been closed to the public, um, ha, do you have a sense of what the reception um, to them has been? Um, what kind of responses that you've received? I've received many positive responses from people who are grateful that the show was there, who have received the message of the quilts in an open-minded and open-hearted manner. But at the same time, I've received a lot of hate mail and I look at it as another badge, okay? Because if the people hadn't looked at the quilts and, and um, hadn't gotten a reaction out of them, they wouldn't have written me nasty letters. But for the most part, I've gotten uh, positive, positive uh, comments. So that's, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. So what do you see as the connection between quilting and healing? As a practitioner, as a quilt maker, first of all, I look at uh, the making of quilts as a spiritual endeavor. I feel too that the quilts are somewhat anointed because God doesn't let us make mistakes. Artists are special people. He doesn't let us make mistakes. And just going through the motions of making a quilt it's very meditated with the quilting. Um, and for the viewer, anytime the quilt has, or any art, has the capacity to touch one's spirit and touch one's heart, I consider my job as a curator and as an artist is done. If you've created a work that is so powerful in nature as to 
touch the spirit of somebody, then that's a good thing. And I think good always triumphs, okay? And I, I look at I look at the quilts as the the good stuff. So and the good stuff is on our side. And um, these quilts are taking us through a hard journey. My personal journey as an African American living here in the United States, it's a it's a hard journey. Every day, every day I go out, you know, <laughs> sometimes it's just hard. So the quilt work triumphs over all of that and it gives me energy to go on the next day and make something else and curate something else and, and write about it. So um, that's a good thing. Um, I don't know what I would do without family and quilts. And I don't know what I would do without uh, the network in my life. They're a part of my family's life. So um, these are all ingredients for me as a human being. Quilts, family, and the network is family. So, um, and the creation of the work is healing. Penny, what what is the connection of healing and quilting for you? Oh, I certainly echo the making of the work, um, as as Dr. Mazalumi was saying. But I will also add this um, in terms of healing. Um, the uh, the times that I have been in attendance for openings, um, in particular, I'm I'm reminded of a, of a, the opening of um, the the first quilt. This revolution will not be televised. Um, uh, it was on exhibition in Fiber Art International here in Pittsburgh in 2016 and opening night, um, I was able to really be there for the reaction of people looking at it. And um, it, the place that it was on, on, on exhibition was a primarily white space. And I cannot tell you how many individuals came up to me and said, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. I had no idea how many black and brown men and women have died at the hands of the police. Um, and I've also had African-Americans um, also say, thank you for, for showing it um, and for getting the word out there. But, but primarily um, knowing that people really are stepping into the work and seeing the names and making that connection and thinking about it, that is a step in healing and learning and growing. Well, I, sorry. I just wanted to add to that. I said earlier that the quilt, quilts, all quilts, I don't care who makes them, all quilts are documents. They're historic documents. And, you know, we make them with the intention to teach. And if I, if I could just have a minute, mm -hmm. I, okay. This comes from an opening too. I always like openings because you, People are just, they're so emotional. Uh, but I received this letter after the opening of um, one of the shows that I curated about African-American history. And this, this woman writes me and she says, I recently saw an exhibition of the And Still We Rise quilts at the Museum of the Shenandoah Valley in Winchester, Virginia, while visiting my daughter and her family. I was so touched, I felt I had to contact you and share my feelings about the exhibit. I was literally blown away by the beauty, ingenuity, artistic ability, and stories these quilts had to tell. As a white American, I was deeply embarrassed that I was so very ignorant of African American history and the huge part that it has played in the history of our country. I'm I am ashamed that such a large and important part of our country's history has been left out of our education. I applaud the efforts of all the artists and, and you and your job as curator of the exhibition. However, I shall take a cue from the quilts and try to retroactively educate myself on the legacy of what is 
been an incredible part of American, uh, of the history of the United States. Anyway, when, when, when I get letters like this and see that the quilts have made a difference in what someone has learned from outside of our culture about African Americans, where they feel more appreciative of our culture and appreciative of us as human beings and know that we played some vital role in making in the making of this country. Um, and we have a place here. And then I consider my job as artist and, and curator is done mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you both so much for joining us tonight, for sharing your story, for sharing your time, for sharing your labor of love with us. Um, this was such a pleasure. And I want to thank you all in the audience um, for joining us tonight and for holding this space with us. And we can't wait to be in community with you again, um, hopefully very soon. Um, so with that, I would like to just share an outro screen um, with you all. We'll be receiving a, a survey, a follow-up, and we would love to hear your feedback about um, your experience from this evening. It helps us create programs that are meaningful and important for you, our community members of the Wiseman Art Museum. And so with that, I say uh, good evening to you all. Stay creative, stay hopeful. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.